طيب دكتور ويل بيجن ذات اوكي ويز يو كان ايفري ون هير مي ثمز اب اف يس وندرفل اوكي ويلكم ايفري بادي تو وات اي بيليف از ذا 14th اونلاين كلتشرال مجلس ماي نيم از سلطان سعود القاسمي اتس ا بليجر تو هاف يو اول هير اند اتس ا جريتر بليجر تو هاف دكتور محمد السديري who will be properly introduced by uh, Mohan in a minute. But I would like to say what a great honor and privilege it is to have Dr. Muhammad here. Dr. Muhammad is one of the uh, foremost uh, young scholars of the Gulf, the Middle East, and anywhere in the world, I think. Uh, it is, he's also a friend and uh, someone, although younger than me, I feel like I learned from him so much. And so it is a, a great, as I said, a great honor to have him here. And uh, to, to add uh, more joy to this occasion, uh, it gives me great pleasure to also introduce uh, my uh, former student at uh, Georgetown University Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, uh, Mohan Chen. Uh, Mohan actually lived in uh, Cairo and in Jerusalem. She won awards for her writing. Uh, she wrote a paper for me on uh, graffiti art and social movement in uh, Palestine and in Egypt. Uh, and uh, she's, uh, she's going to be introducing Dr. Mohammed Sidiri, and she is based, I believe, still in Washington, D.C. Is that correct, Mohan? <laughs> you may introduce the guest. Okay. Thank you, Ustaz. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Mohan Chen, and I'm a first year grad student from Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Ustaz Sultan for hosting this online majlis and letting me introduce Dr. Mohammed al -Sudari. Dr. Mohammed al -Sudari is a non-resident senior res researcher and head of the Asian Studies Unit at the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. He is also a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Hong Kong. al -Sudari obtained a PhD in comparative politics from the University of Hong Kong, a double degree master's from Peking University and the London School of Economics in International Relations and International History. And he got his bachelor's degree also from SFS at Georgetown University. His research interests encompass Sino-Middle Eastern relations, Islamic and leftist connections between East Asia and the Arab world, and Chinese domestic politics. Today, Dr. Astario is here with us to talk about the Arabs of uh, modern China, intellectuals, and diasporas. He will focus on the history of the Arab community in China and some key individuals from 1949 to the early 90s. So now please join me in welcoming Dr. Astari. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Chen. Um, I'd also like to express my own thanks and gratitude to Sultan and the wider team. It's really a very, an honor to be able to use this platform to share my interests in research. Um, I think before I jump into the lecture, I'd like to sort of preface my talk by saying that um, the presentation actually could go on for hours. This is a subject matter that I'm extremely interested in, and it's something that I've worked on and off on for uh, the past eight years. Uh, but because of the time limits, I'm forced to congest considerable amounts of material within a 30-minute frame. So there are parts of the presentation that I'll jump over. I encourage you to ask me questions during the Q&A. And think of this lecture more as an attempt to give you a taste about this uh, Arab presence in China, especially in the Maoist era. Uh, let me just first share, okay. Uh, can someone uh, disable the, part, the participant screen sharing because I would like to share the screen. Uh, is it? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, it's not allowing me to share the screen. It oh, yeah. says host disabled participant screen sharing. Hadar, Hadar, this is my fault. I'm sorry. And we just no tested it. Uh, sharing. Uh, who can share? One second. Father Doctor, try and do it now. Okay. Oh, perfect. It's working now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Sorry about the delay. I should get an extra minute as a result of technical <laughs> difficulties. This is only yeah. uh, fair. Um, okay, so I think when talking about the Arab presence in China, we have to look at it from a broader historical context. That is to say, there were many Arab influxes 
into the area that the cultural zone that we associate with China today. And this, these influxes span over the course of a millennia with um, Arabs coming in uh, back all the way back to the sixth and seventh centuries, even prior to the rise of Islam. Uh, although the majority of these influxes are very much combined with the rise of Arab power in West Asia in the seventh century and the emergence of Islam as a global religion and Arab dominance over the maritime and overland trade routes in Central Asia and across the Indian Ocean. And Arabs came to China over successive centuries as traders following the seasonal winds, as uh, soldiers in some cases, as preachers. And we get a sense of the high degree of cultural familiarity that these influxes have developed with China from Arab writings uh, all the way back from the 8th century onwards, where actually Chinese cities had Arabized names. So, for example, the Tang capital of Chang'an was known as Hamdan. Um, or, for example, the coastal cities whose fortunes rose and fell with successive Chinese dynasties also had very particular Arab names. So, the city over here, Hangzhou was known as Al Khansa. Uh, the city of Chuanzhou was known as Zaytun. Uh, the city of Guangzhou was known as Hanfu. Uh, and the Arab presence in China over the course of millennia developed consider a considerable material and spiritual presence. So if you go to a city like Chuanzhou today and visit the Masjid al Ashab, the Mosque of the Companions, the Shangyo Si, this is probably one of the few examples outside of the Middle East of Abbasid architecture, right? This was a mosque that was established uh, during the Song period around 1004 AD. And the mosque itself is absolutely beautiful. Inside also the grounds of the mosque, there's a very large cemetery that contains a lot of tombstones uh, with Arabic phrases, as well as Farsi phrases. Because when we talk about the presence of Muslim communities, it's often a very cosmopolitan polygot grouping. And in fact, I know this is an art platform so I recommend people who are uh, interested in this to check out an, a Chinese artist who mostly works with gunpowder called Tsai Guoqiang. Uh, and he actually did a project because he comes from the city of Chuanzhou, where he tried to inscribe the wording on these tombstones on stone from Chuanzhou itself. And then he sort of showcased it in different exhibitions across the Gulf around 10 years ago. Um, but even beyond the material, there's a spiritual presence that the Arabs have left. So in the imaginary of many of the Chinese speaking Muslim communities in China, the coming of Islam is deeply associated with the coming of Arabs. So if you go to a place like the city of Guangzhou, these are my own pictures. Uh, you can go and see the shrine of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, whom we know historically is actually buried in Medina, um, but there's a very strong belief that he was sent by the prophet to China to bring Islam there. And this shrine actually is visited by many Sufi orders across China. When I visited uh, last uh, end of last year, there was even actually a lot of international Muslim pilgrims going there from the Maldives, from Malaysia, Indonesia. So it's interesting to think about these different circuits that are emerging. Um, now, the general Arab presence, or these Arab influxes begin to decline from the 14th, 15th century onwards with the end of Mongol rule and the global disruptions in trade that accompanied the uh, European city in the ocean. But it did not necessarily mean that flooding China completely stopped. Merchants continued to trickle in. And what's even more interesting is that new types of uh, influxes came with the European imperial enterprise. So in the 19th century, for example, we have uh, many cases of Baghdadi Jews, uh, famous families like the Sassoons or the Khudris and others, or the Kaduris, their anglicized name, who came with the British and settled in the treaty ports like Shanghai or in British-ruled Hong Kong and developed massive fortunes uh, from trade in opium, tea, banking, and some of the most iconic buildings in these places, like say the Sassoon House in Shanghai and the Bund, or the Peninsula Hotel, owned by the Kaduri family up to this day in Hong Kong, are very much associated with their presence. And I, what's interesting about these families is that they continued to use Arabic up to the early 20th century as a way to make sure that their business competitors would not know what deals they're trying to strike or what type of um, bookkeeping they're maintaining. So it's very interesting in that respect. And in many ways, the contemporary Arab communities that have emerged from the late 1980s onwards as China began to globalize, and these communities mostly concentrated in cities like Guangzhou 
or um, so this is the, the right, the picture on the right is an area from Guangzhou called Xiaobeilu, which has a very strong Arab and African presence, or in Yiwu, the picture on the left, or even cities like Keqiao, where you have up to this moment, tens of thousands of Arabs settled there, mostly from the Hadrami communities. Uh, again, a community very much associated and involved in trade. Uh, who give echoes of these, this history of Arab influxes, of an Arab presence that's rooted in very cosmopolitan coastal cities. So you can see the larger frame. Now I sort of want to focus a bit on the lecture itself and what I'm going to be talking about. The, the iteration of Arabs that I'm particularly interested in are those who came in the Maoist uh, and early post-Maoist era. And my Maoist here, I mean the era that begins with the establishment of the People's Republic in 1949 and ends with the death of Mao in 1976. And the post-Maoist era is the subsequent era that I extend all the way to the late 1980s, early 1990s. And it's a particularly interesting era because in comparison to the pre-communist rule uh, and also the subsequent 1980s, which was very globalized, this was a period where China was relatively closed off from foreign influences. And there was a high degree of foreign control over foreign community, or, sorry, high degree of control over foreign communities writ large. And the Arab presence there is quite interesting and has been largely neglected, especially, for example, in the broader literature on China and the Middle East. So the hope here is to sort of highlight these communities. Um, and I think one entry point into talking uh, about the Arab community in the Maoist era is uh, Mahida or George Shafiq Hatem. And the reason why I begin with him is really quite simple. When the communists took power in uh, 1949 and they defeated the nationalists who fled to Taiwan, they began a policy which could be essentially translated as cleaning the house before inviting the guests in. And this policy was essentially aimed at pushing out many of the foreign communities in China that were associated with the old imperial powers, the Japanese, uh, the European and American communities. And the reason for this is quite simple. These communities dominated the industrial and business sectors. They exercised control over universities, hospitals, and religious institutions. So by pushing them out, this would create space for the nationalization of these sectors and also getting rid of elements that were involved in spying and whatnot. There was a small community of foreigners, however, that were exempt from this policy. And these were foreigners who had developed long-standing links with the Communist Party of China. And one of these figures is a very interesting Lebanese American, George Shafiq Hatem, uh, who actually eventually gained Chinese citizenship and was also given membership into the Communist Party of China. So he was born in New York. Uh, he comes from a Maronite uh, family that hails from the Shuf Mountains. Um, he studied medicine. He actually went to the American University of Beirut for a short time, but it didn't work out for him. He traveled a bit around Europe and Asia and eventually arrived in Shanghai in 1933, uh, where he was involved in various types of small businesses as well as different medical services, and he developed contact with the communist underground. Eventually, in 1936, he was invited through different networks to come to uh, join the communists in Yan'an, which was their base in the northwest of China uh, and a place of refuge from the nationalists whom they were involved in a civil war with. And he actually went in 1936 with Edgar Snow, who was a famous American journalist uh, who wrote the book Red Star Over China. That was essentially the first book talking about the Communist Party and presenting it to the world in the English language. Uh, in any case, Shafiq, they tapped onto him because he was a foreign doctor. Uh, and, that, and he, from then on, became a uh, loyal accomplice to the Communist Party since then. Um, and he's quite interesting. Like, if you look at different state narratives from the Chinese state, as well as um, different studies conducted on the Arab diaspora, he's sometimes presented as the patriarch of the Arab diaspora there. So he's a good starting point. Although I should mention, he's very chameleon-like. So if you look at a lot of different stories surrounding him, uh, you can never know whether he's really uh, someone who thinks of himself as an Arab or he's playing out his Arab identity. So there are stories where in the 1930s, when he was accompanying the Red Army across Muslim villages, uh, he would act as if he was a Muslim and would mouth a few Arabic words, and he couldn't speak Arabic. 
um, and he himself was of Christian Maronite background. So the Muslim villagers would give food to the army as well as him, assuming that he's a co-religionist. Uh, there are other incidents where following the establishment of the People's Republic, he enjoyed wearing the Uyghur Dukha, the traditional hat associated with the Uyghurs from Northwest China. Um, and he would always tell people, oh, I'm actually from these minorities. Uh, or when Americans would visit, he would emphasize that he's an American as opposed to an Arab. And his son, actually, who's in this picture right here, Khalid is his name, or Zhou uh, Yoma, uh, he said that his father and his recollections always talked of himself as an American. So there's a big question mark about him, but he's a very good starting point. Uh, these are pictures of him with Mao uh, on the left. Um, I should also mention, because he was a doctor after the establishment of the People's Republic, he was involved in the Ministry of Health, and he's associated with the eradication of leprosy. Again, it's a contested claim. Uh, and this is, of course, a statue created by the Chinese embassy uh, in his town or home to, claimed hometown of Hamana, Lebanon. Now, um, putting aside George Hatem, who's sort of a very exceptional figure, maybe we can talk about how the other Arabs ended up in China. So in the early 1950s, the communist government faced a particular quandary, which was no Arab state up to 1956 recognized their authority and claim as the legitimate government over China. Many of them maintained their connection with the nationalists in Taiwan. And in fact, this would be a persistent issue throughout the Cold War. So uh, for example, Saudi Arabia was effectively the last Arab government to shift recognition, and that was in 1990. So this would be something that would dominate their uh, foreign policy for quite some time, not just with respect to the Arab world, but many different places. So the issue, or they developed a foreign policy outreach that was aimed at cultivating international friends who would advocate in favor of normalizing diplomatic ties. Now, because there was, of course, no embassies, they had to rely on what were called people's organizations. I'm not going to go too deeply into what these are, but essentially these were, uh, they have domestic functions within China, but they have a presumed non-governmental profile. So these organizations would go abroad to international meetings. They would meet with different figures or groups, and then invite them to come to China and planned uh, tours. Um, so actually, a lot of people came on these planned tours in the 1950s and 1960s, and it led to a massive cottage industry of books uh, that are part of what could be called as Adab al or travel literature to China. Uh, so people were writing uh, different, I mean, most of the titles followed the same formula, Iraqi for Sina Shabia, Masri for Sina Shabia, and Egyptian in China, Sudanese in China, and the like. Uh, and in fact, some very interesting figures ended up going on these planned tours and writing their own uh, books about them, including Hassan Kenafani, the very famous Palestinian novelist, who was in 1965 as uh, the editor of Al Muhallaq, who was oh. heading at the time. Um, and he wrote about his experiences. Yes, yes. Uh, can we switch off your video for a, a, until your, the presentation ends? Because there's a bit of a lag. Oh, sure. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to. Uh... Just turn off your video, but keep the presentation. Oh, okay. Well, let me just return it, then I'll share it. And then. Uh... Okay, wait, no, I have to stop the video. Sorry about that. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Let me share it again. Okay, back to it. Wow. Thank okay, you. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, no worries. So, um, Ghassan Kenafani was actually one of the individuals who ended up going on these planned tours. Um, he actually, this particular book was originally a series of articles that related his experiences going to multiple Asian countries, beginning with China, but then Thailand and India. But he was probably, he was mostly deeply impressed by China. Um, and actually it was only recently published in full and made accessible to the public a few years ago. There was a volume series of his writings that was issued and I really encourage people to check it out. Um, but, I don't want to talk too much about what people wrote in these different books because I feel um, this would take too much time and a lot of these were short-term visitors. But the key point to take away from all this is that some of these visitors ended up returning to China as experts or long-term residents. 
Um, and again, if people are interested in knowing what people saw, what were their itineraries, what were their impressions, I'd be more than happy to talk about it during the Q&A. Now, aside from the diplomatic outreach that I talked about, um, there was another reason for trying to cultivate these networks of international friends, which was to try and identify individuals for recruitment who can come and support the efforts of the state to develop its diplomatic apparatus as well as support its propaganda system. Because of course there was a lack in terms of linguistic capacity. So they needed foreign language teachers to come teach at the universities or even at dedicated institutions associated with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Or to work in the propaganda system with entities like the Foreign Languages Press, which ran uh, many different periodicals and magazines like China Pictorial, Peking Review, et cetera or issued and published books on government policies, approaches towards minorities and cultures, et cetera. And as a result of a number of Arab states recognizing the Republic, and also because of the growing importance of the third world, became increasingly more significant. So uh, for instance, Asin al-Musawwara and Bina Asin particularly were constantly issued in Arabic starting from 1964. Um, and actually, as Bina Asin later became Asin al uh, which continues to exist today in, in an Arabic version. By the mid 1960s, the, the propaganda material also began to change. So you had more revolutionarily themed uh, publications. For example, these are the plays and operatas associated with Jiang Qing, Mao's wife, the model operas that were translated into Arabic. Uh, and by the late 1960s, in fact, the key, for example, now works, the four volumes were translated into Arabic, as well as the Little Red Book. Uh, and the Little Red Book, um, you know, just to give you an idea of how important and central it was during that particular phase in Chinese foreign policy, it estimated that around a billion copies had been issued in multiple languages between 1969 and 1971. Um, and in fact, I think now this is a very good entry point into talking about who the foreign experts were, the Wai Guajuan, yeah, particularly the Arabs. So in the 1950s, the majority of the foreign experts who came in were mostly uh, associated with Arab communist parties uh, because relations were good. And these were oftentimes the first entities that the, the people's organizations had engaged with in international contexts. Um, and these people, of course, you know, maintained their organizational life in China. They had party cells. They maintained ties with the leadership back home. However, by 1960, in July specifically, uh, the profile of the Arab foreign experts changes dramatically. And the reason for that is that the Soviet Union actually pulls out the majority of its own experts from China as a result of growing tensions between China and the Soviet Union. Uh, which we don't need to go into, but also that, that became a very vicious struggle that marked China's foreign policy for much of the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and Arab communist parties were largely aligned with the Soviet Union. So they decided in solidarity with the Soviets to also withdraw their cadres and fellow travelers, most of whom actually went to China to escape from persecution back home. Um, so the profile dramatically changed and a lot of the people who subsequently came were either non-communists or were her outright sympathizers with the Maoist communist line. So actually, um, the reason why I stopped at these works, uh, the Little Red Book, as well as the four volumed works, is because there's one very interesting figure, I was not able to find the picture of him, who is, who is primarily associated with the translation of these works. And his name is Ahmed Khair. Uh, he's a Sudanese communist, who was associated in, in the anti-colonial movement in Sudan in the 1940s and eventually developed an international profile for himself in the 1950s. Uh, in the early 1960s, uh, he decides to actually take refuge in China. And the reason I think is very closely connected with the failed Maoist takeover within the Communist Party of Sudan. Um, so he eventually stays in China and he becomes very active in translating different works, providing his services, writing articles in favor of uh, the Maoist line. And during the Cultural Revolution, he He was one of the few foreigners who was invited to join the leadership on the podiums during the mass rallies. And presumably, according to one excellent scholar who works on Chinese-Arab relations, Ahmed Khair, who translated 
Mao's key works, including the Little Red Book, as well as the four volumes over a succession of years. Unfortunately, Ahmed Khair sort of completely disappears. We don't know much what happened to him uh, after the 1970s. He presumably died, but uh, unfortunately, yeah, it's, it's, uh, maybe the information is out there, but we need to dig more. Um, now, of course, we know a lot about the social life of the Arab foreign expert communities in China and the broader Arab diaspora, which I'll get to in a moment, primarily because of the writings of Hanamina. Uh, and actually, uh, it's a, he wrote a very interesting trilogy called Hadith uh, Afi Beitahu, which is, it happened in Beidaikha. Beidaikha is actually a, um, a coastal uh, seaside uh, resting area that actually is still used by the Communist Party of China today, where they meet in the summer, the leadership. Uh, but foreign experts also used to go there to relax and whatnot. He wrote this trilogy based on his own experiences as a foreign expert who went to China to teach Arabic in Peking University in the early 1960s. And then Mina, a Syrian novelist, we don't know. Um, and the protagonist, uh, who's named, um, uh, I think, Zuleyd al-Shajari, is based on him. He's sort of like a womanizing, constantly drunk, very disillusioned uh, Arab communist um, who has many different opinions and reflections about the China writ large. Um, and what he really conveys in, these, in this novel series is how isolated the Arab foreign experts were. They lived in what Beverly Hooper has called a type of privileged isolation, right? Uh, they were living in a compound that was isolated from the rest of society. They were actually not allowed to, to engage with broader Chinese society or fraternize with uh, Chinese women uh, uh, beyond professional context. Uh, they lived in con a considerably high living standard. Uh, they had their own restaurants, gyms, very much similar to the compounds in the Gulf today, uh, where you know uh, Westerners and other groups live in. Um, they also had salaries that were seven or eightfold higher than those of the Chinese population, generally speaking. Um, and what's interesting, it's because of this relative isolation that is imposed by the system, they were quite inward looking and much of their social life was uh, oriented towards the broader Arab diaspora that was emerging at the time. Oh, this is, by the way, the compound that a lot of them lived in, particularly in Beijing, although there are satellite compounds in other places in China. Uh, it's called the Friendship Hotel, which was actually initially called Druzhba, Russian word for friendship, but I think they altered it and got rid of it as the conflict with the Soviet Union increased. Um, who were the broader Arab diaspora that these uh, foreign experts were engaged with in the late 1950s and 1960s? So, there was a small grouping of students who came from different Arab countries on government scholarships provided by China. Uh, but these uh, numbers of students were quite low. And in fact, there was a very high attrition rate because people could not adapt to the academic, social realities of living in China. Uh, and it's an attrition rate similar to what was happening with African students who came there in the late 1950s and 1960s. And it's really only in the 1970s and 1980s that we begin to see a growth in the student population that's reflected in the formation of student associations. Uh, also, there were guerrilla fighters who were coming in, especially in the late 60s. Uh, some of these were associated with the PLO, which had established formal diplomatic ties with China in 1965. And they came for different types of military training, as well as uh, some Khalijis. So for example, the Dhufaris sent people for uh, political and ideological training in 1968 and 1969, very small groups but they also engage with the broader And some of these guerrilla fighters settled in China. So this is one particularly interesting example, Mustafa Safarini, who was the uh, Palestinian ambassador to China in the 1990s. Um, and his story is actually quite hilarious. I've spent many, many days in his office chatting and whatnot. And uh, he actually was initially sent as a guerrilla fighter in the late 1960s. And then he was subsequently ordered by to remain in China. And he stayed and he became a student and he was, you know, he has all these different stories of being the only student in a huge, gigantic, empty classroom during the Cultural Revolution, being taught Chinese uh, by teachers who just did not develop a sufficient system to teach it to foreigners yet. 
Um, and he eventually actually became a diplomat, a rotating diplomat in many different embassies in, in Thailand, North Korea, and eventually in China. Very interesting individual. Uh, and of course, beyond the students and the guerrilla fighters, there are, of course, the diplomatic missions themselves, which often had very tense relationships with the foreign experts, understandably, because a lot of them were escapees from government persecution back home. Um, so uh, they often did not engage. But the, nevertheless, the embassies uh, played a role similar to their Western equivalents in the sense that they provided room for cultural activities that were not available at the time in China. There was not much of a nightlife. There wasn't much of uh, bars or cafes or restaurants uh, as we now see in modern Chinese cities. Um, so oftentimes the embassies would hold parties or host, for example, viewings of Arabic classical films, Egyptian cinema, et cetera, especially in the 1960s. And it's as an interesting side note, uh, one very prominent um, intellectual and poet uh, from the Arab world, but it was more of a poet really than an intellectual, Nizar Qabbani, ended up being a secretary in the United Arab Republic's embassy from 1958 to 1960. Um, and he was, I mean, so, several people who had come to China on the plant tours, make mention of him. And um, it was actually, interestingly enough, while he didn't write much of China, those two years were one of his most productive in terms of uh, poetry writing and uh, also sort of the compilation of songs. Um, I should mention as a very last quick note before I jump into talking about the Arab intellectuals, um, that the Arab diaspora had a very uh, vigorous political life in China. So throughout the 1960s and 1970s, and even up to the late 1980s, there were constant mobilizations and protests. Um, for example, there was an orchestrated attack with the Red Guard uh, that involved many students as well as the Arab foreign experts against the British embassy during the 1967 war. Uh, there were multiple repeated protests and demonstrations that were organized organically by the community in relation to the signing of the uh, Camp David Accords, the Sabran Shatila massacres, the Israeli invasion of uh, Lebanon. And in fact, um, the last protest to be held organically by Arabs in China was in 1988, which was related to the assassination uh, of Khalil Wazir, Abu Jihad, a prominent figure in Fatah who was assassinated by the Mossad in Tunisia. Uh, and in fact, this picture on the left, and I'm sorry, this really shows my limited technical capacity. It has like sort of the icon from the, the mobile phone. But this was a picture of that last protest from 1988. And of course, um, no other protests were held subsequently because one year later we have Tiananmen. And of course, the context in China becomes a lot more sensitive. Um, I think I sort of maybe took too much time, but I'd like to spend the last five minutes highlighting some Arab intellectual figures who were in China. And I'll live, give room in the Q&A, I hope, for someone to pose a question about these particular individuals. So some of the Arab intellectuals who came as foreign experts um, uh, include people like uh, Ghaib Tu'ma Farman, a very famous Iraqi novelist, who was probably the earliest prominent Arab intellectual in China, and who came sometime in 1957-58. Uh, and this was because he was invited by the Chinese to come because his citizenship was revoked by the Iraqi uh, authorities. Uh, and he was actually attending an international meeting in the Soviet Union. So the Chinese used that as an opportunity to invite him to come to China. He only stayed for a short time because he left after the revolution in Iraq. But sadly, I mean, his life is really very much characterized by exile because he then leaves to the Soviet Union and he dies there um, uh, in 1990. Other figures include Abdul Marin al Muluhi, who's a very interesting uh, Syrian uh, writer, poet, as well as translator. He's very much associated, he's one of the first major Arab scholars who translated uh, works related to national Vietnamese literature into Arabic, and also was one of the first to translate Chinese poetry uh, into Arabic. He had two major volumes in 1968 and another one in the 1970s. Um, of course, these people were not translating from these languages, but they were translating from French or English. And this is actually the case for many of the Arab foreign experts. Very few of them actually um, had proficiency in Chinese. Another interesting figure is Salama Ubaid, a historian and poet uh, and active writer. 
who was actually one of the individuals who came to China on a planned tour in 1966 and was completely enthralled by the country. Uh, he wrote a book about it called the Shark al Ahmar, uh, the one on the right, and that's actually my own personal copy. Um, he very much uh, thought of China, he, he termed the country a leftist Wahhabi state, which he really sort of was very, he admired considerably. I can explain what that means. But in any case, he was one of the few Arab experts who remained in China for a very, very long time, uh, roughly from, um, if I'm not mistaken, 1972 all the way to 1984, so 12 years in total. Uh, he, this is him in a picture with Abdul Ma'in al Maruhi, who is a friend of him. And his biggest contribution, uh, aside, of course, from compiling a lot of course material for the teaching of Arabic in Peking University where he worked, is his big contribution in creating the first major Chinese Arabic dictionary. Right, which was a work that took many multiple decades. And he's actually mentioned in the preface. I have my own personal copy of it. Um, and this is sort of one of his long-term contributions. Another whimsical and interesting character is Jalal al-Hanafi, who is a Iraqi uh, a sheikh, uh, faqih, uh, who was also a musician and a scholar very well known in Baghdad. He, preserved, he was one of the people who actively preserved the history and folklore of Baghdad. And he was sent by the Iraqi government to go to China uh, in 1966 and then and remained there for 10 years. So throughout the course of the Cultural Revolution. And uh, he taught presumably Arabic, but he was one of the very interesting people because he ended up actually learning Chinese. And we have you know, certain articles that he had compiled in the late 1960s where he talks about his attempt to try and create a system for the learning of Chinese using Arabic letters and diacritics, uh, uh, the different harakat, for example. And he actually wanted to even build a typewriter that would allow people to write uh, using the system Chinese, but Latinized, right? So similar to the pinyin system that relies on English characters to convey Chinese sounds. Uh, and of course, the last person, um, and I won't go too much into him, although he's probably the jewel of this presentation, and I'll let people talk about, ask about him in the Q&A, is Hadi al-Alawi. Uh, and Hadi al-Alawi is probably one of the most underappreciated uh, Arabic radical scholars of the 20th century. Uh, and Hadi al-Alawi, it's interesting, his story is very much connected to Jalal al-Hanafi because he ended up going to China because he was trying to escape the Ba'athist rule in Iraq on the recommendation of Jalal al-Hanafi to the Chinese embassy. So Hadi al-Alawi very quickly um, is a, uh, comes from a poor Shiite but scholarly background from Baghdad. Um, I think from very, er very early age was very much attracted by Marxism and leftist currents. Um, and this was actually reflected in his character as a whole. So when he was graduating, for example, from Baghdad University, and uh, he was one of the uh, one of the excellent academic uh, students. Uh, during the graduation ceremony, such students were given the privilege of shaking the hand of the king, King Faisal II at the time. He was the only person who had refused to shake his hand. And he is particularly famous uh, beginning in the 1960 onwards for his production of a considerable number of books that try to engage with the Arabic Islamic tradition, the Torah, from a very subversive perspective. So he has tons of books that look at, for example, the history of assassination in Islam, the, um, the history of the socialist currents and class conflict in the Abbasid era. Um, very much enthralled by many different things. And China, in his thinking, occupied a central position to the point where when he talks about his intellectual journey, he talks about a pre-China and a post-China phase. So his going there in 1977 was actually quite transformative. Um, and very early on, he began to engage a lot of philosophical works on China, uh, works on Chinese civilization, poetry, religion, Taoism. And his sort of theoretical outlook is as such. He believes that Chinese and Islamic civilizations both have what he calls a communalist tendency. Uh, and he actually prefers the term communalism, mashaiya, as opposed to communism or shuriya. And he thinks communalism 
connotes, denotes a type of communism of the heart. That is to say, it's about a collectivism that's oriented towards serving the people and isn't concerned with grand theory. And he believes that Islamic and Chinese civilization, because of how they've evolved and whatnot, don't have the same feudalist tendencies that mark Western civilization. And this communalism is expressed in the existence of very specific religious or spiritual traditions in these civilizations. Uh, in his particular opinion, certain streams of Sufism in Islamic civilization and Taoism in Chinese civilization, or philosophical Taoism as opposed to folk Taoism. So the idea being is that these traditions allow people to transcend the idea of believing in an anthropomorphic God, and they emphasize a divine relationship with the universe as a whole, a type of wihdat al-wujud, a oneness of being, whereby the, the individual who subscribes to this view no longer cares about his own person and no longer is scared of authority or enamored by wealth or is in pursuit of base uh, desires like sex or food or what have you. Uh, and that this person becomes something like a universal thinker who is primarily concerned with how can they benefit the people. So for him, for example, the universal thinker al-Mufakkir al-Alami include people who are very rare in the course of human history, people like uh, Lao Tzu, the founder or the, myst the mythical founder of the Taoist tradition, al-Ma'arri, the free-thinking uh, Arab philosopher, uh, or Marx even. Uh, and um, I should say that he, in terms of how his views about China, and again, I know I've extended my time considerably, uh, were complex because he thought that, or he believed that Maoist China succeeded in establishing communism, at least pre-cultural revolution, because the communists had cynicized Marxism. That is to say, they accepted the communalist and Taoist tendencies that were inherent to Chinese civilization. So he uses a very interesting phrase to talk about this successful formula, they had succeeded in Taoifying Marxism or Marxifying Taoism. And he believes that actually what caused the failure of this communist experience in China was uh, Mao's attempt to replicate a translated communism, which he was also very critical in the case of the Arab world. And he said people should try to adapt Marxist experiences to local contexts. And in his language, he said that they, he had adopted Stalinism. And he also claimed other things that, you know, Mao Kharra, he, he'd become a bit crazy, et cetera, during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, but he still admired Mao. And in fact, he was quite disillusioned uh, by the aftermath of Mao's death, which essentially saw the rise of Deng to power and the beginning of a new China um, of the reform and opening up. He actually said that 1979 marked the beginning of the second bourgeois republic in China. And even during his repeated returns to China, and especially in the 1990s, he was very disillusioned by what he saw as the takeover of American culture and the rise of commercial tendencies um, across Chinese society. Um, in any case, he's one of, I think, one of the most underappreciated authors and his contributions to the Arabic library in terms of works on China are immense. I mean, he's one of the few people that I know who has written books like al mustafa Fassini, which is a book giving a sort of overview of Chinese philosophy and civilization, or even Kitab al-Tao, the Book of Tao, which introduces Arabic readers for the first time to Taoist philosophy. Uh, I think I'll end there because I've overstayed my <laughs> welcome in terms of the lecture. Victor, thank you so much. Uh, that's very, very interesting. Could you uh, stop sharing your uh, your presentation, and then I will ask you to turn on uh, your uh, video so that we can see your. Uh, what you say that? 